May I preach to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we get ready for the annual meeting, one of the things that always comes to mind for me is that it's usually a time when congregations and vestries begin to talk about things like mission statements. And every year, consultants are hired for companies and nonprofits and even churches to get an idea about what is the mission and how do we craft the perfect mission statement to really exemplify what we want to accomplish. Now, there's ways to do it, and there's ways not to do it. A mission statement is something not about what we want the world to be like, but about how we're going to get to the vision that's been given to us. So here's an example of what not to do. St. Swithin's Church exists for the passion and purpose of inspiring, discipling, equipping, and sending out Christ followers with the destiny of transforming the world to the glory of God the Father. This, this is going to take a while. Way too long. Way too long. The best thing, though, about the Episcopal Church is that we don't have to hire consultants. We don't have to get other people to write a mission statement for us. It's in the prayer book. It's, it's in the back. It's tucked in there in the catechism. If you've never looked back there, go ahead, take the prayer book home page 865, I think. And it says, the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. Just rolls right off the tongue. Perfect. Because what the mission is saying is that the vision that God has created for how people should live together and work together and be together can only be accomplished when people come together in Christ, when they have a reconciled relationship with Jesus and one another. And keeping this mission as the focus of the church is very hard because we get distracted. There's all different things that happen in a church building projects and new programs and all types of things that come and go that can sometimes, if we're not careful, move us away from the mission, which is this, that mission of restoration. As we journey through Mark's gospel, we now come to one of the most pivotal points. And it doesn't necessarily sound like that when we read it, but it's true. So if you go back to your bulletin insert here, Jesus has now come. He's left the synagogue. He's entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, and his mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. Jesus cures her, which, by the way, somebody once preached, this proves that Jesus loves even mothers-in-law. And I said, I've got two great ones, so this doesn't apply to me. But it says, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. Imagine that sight for just a moment. Imagine if the whole town in which you lived gathered at the door of the church and said, help us. Cure us. Minister to us. I can't imagine what Jesus was feeling as he saw this sight and how as a human being, because he is truly human even though he is God, how he must have felt so overwhelmed to see this level of suffering. It reminds me of when there's a natural disaster, you really need two views to assess the damage. You need that up-close view. You need to drive through the streets to see what's happened. 
but you also need that bird's eye view to really get a sense of how bad things are as well. And so Jesus has a unique view of what this suffering looks like. And what does he do in reaction to it? Well, it says, in the morning while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Jesus' reaction to suffering, Jesus' reaction to possibly feeling overwhelmed, is to go and spend time with his Father in prayer. To go be in communion with God. That's why we take retreats. That's why we take vacations and sabbaticals, because we as Christians need to take some time away to get a little bit of perspective to be renewed and restored by God so that we may come back and continue the work to which God has called us. But then something even stranger happens. Everybody is looking for him. That's not the strange part. They're always hunting for Jesus. But when they find him and they say, everyone is searching for you, they're expecting that Jesus will come back to the same exact spot at Simon's house and continue to minister there. And he says, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. That's a profound statement. Because what Jesus is saying in that moment is, yes, I have come to serve and to heal and to cast out demons, but the mission is to proclaim the message. And what is that message if not repent, return to God, believe in the gospel? I can't imagine the feeling that must have happened for Jesus knowing he had to step away. And the feeling of the people who knew he had in some way to step away from them. But the mission that he was on continued. Whenever Jesus left, he always did so when it was absolutely necessary. It's kind of a theme that Jesus continues to leave. He'll leave and go off and pray by himself. He'll leave the disciples because he needs to go pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the night before he dies, he tells the disciples that he is leaving and that they can't follow him, that they can't go to where he's planning to go. And of course, they don't understand he's talking about his death. Even at the ascension, the last moment after Jesus has risen from the dead and it has been 50 days and they ask him, because they still don't understand, are you going to restore the kingdom? He says, no, I am leaving, but I will not leave you orphaned. I am leaving so that the great advocate can come and be with you, the Holy Spirit. The theme that Jesus is trying to give us in the scriptures is that even when he must leave, he says it explicitly, I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you abandoned. And so for Jesus, as he continues his mission, he now tells us that we must continue the mission which we've been given. Each one of us has been given the mission of proclaiming the gospel wherever we are, however we are, to whomever we meet. I got to admit, this is hard. Because number one, there's sometimes I'm going out and proclaiming the gospel and Jesus does not feel nearby. In fact, there are times when Jesus feels even further away than I wish that he was. But it's only in those moments when I remember that every single time I have turned to Jesus, he has been there. Every time I have prayed, in some way, he has answered. Maybe not the answer I want, but he's answered. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a mission. So let me be real here for a moment. 
no, I did not select this particular gospel reading for today. Okay, no, I am not Jesus. Okay, I checked. She checked too. So I'm, let, me just gonna, let me just drop this facade for just a moment. Preparing and thinking about this gospel has only made it more difficult in discernment with each and every single one of you because of the love I have for you. And when Jesus himself said, take up your cross and follow me, he was saying, come and join me on the mission. And so when Jesus says, come here or go there, we have a choice. In fact, remember all the scriptures we've been reading in the Old Testament about people who get called? What happens to the ones who don't answer the call right away? They end up in a whale. <laughs> right? I say this because the mission of the church has not changed. The mission of our parish has not changed. And from the time when I began to the moment that we are together here, that mission will continue to be one that we do together. And then beyond that, that mission will always continue until that moment when Christ looks each one of us in the eye and says, Thank you, good and faithful servant. Amen.